Uh, hi, everyone. Thanks for attending this seminar hosted by our group. And many thanks for Hongwei's enthusiasm for sharing his insightful topics here. Uh, Dr. Wang is currently postdoctoral researcher at Computer Science Department of UIUC. Before that, he was postdoctoral researcher at CS Department of Stanford University. After he received his PhD degree from Shanghai Jiao Tong University, he was one of the recipients of 2020 CCF Outstanding uh, Doctoral Dissertations Award and 2018 uh, Google PhD Fellowship. Uh, let's welcome his talk today. Uh, here's your floor, uh, Prof. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, let me share my screen. We can see the slide now, yeah, thank you. Okay, okay. So, uh, good morning, everyone. So uh, I'm Hong Wei Wang from University of Illinois, uh, Urbana-Champaign. So uh, thanks for attending my talk. So, so the, the title of my uh, presentation today, sorry, is uh, Graph Representation Learning from Knowledge Graphs to Recommender Systems. So in this uh, talk, I will introduce some of my work. So if you have any uh, question during my presentation, just feel free to drop, uh, drop to me and just ask. So uh, first I would like to uh, briefly introduce myself. Uh, you mute your when Profon is talking. Thanks. Yeah, I've muted them, sorry about that. It's okay. So uh, our first, uh, uh, I, I would like to briefly introduce myself. So uh, I got both my bachelor and PhD degrees from Shanghai Jiao Tong University in 2014 and 2018. And uh, I was a postdoc researcher at Stanford University from 2019 to 2021. And now I'm a postdoc at UIUC. And I won the uh, 2018 Google PhD Fellowship and uh, 2020 CCF Outstanding Doctoral Dissertation Award. And my research interests uh, basically include graph neural networks, knowledge graphs, and recommender systems. So uh, here is the content of my talk today. So I will first briefly introduce the concept of graph representation learning. Then I will introduce uh, graph neural networks, which is a special type of graph representation learning methods. And then I will introduce uh, knowledge graphs, which is a special type, uh, which is a special type of graphs. And next, I will talk about uh, two tasks uh, related to knowledge graphs. The first is knowledge graph completion, which uh, consists of one of my work, uh, a GN-based method uh, called PASCOM. And another task is the uh, knowledge graph aware recommendation, uh, which consists of uh, two classes of my work. Uh, the first is an embedding-based method called DKN, and, and uh, the second is two structure-based methods called uh, KGCN and KGNLS. So, okay, so uh, let's first see uh, what are graphs. So in, uh, in mathematics and more specifically in, in, in graph theory, a graph is a structure amounting to a set of objects in which some pair of nodes are in some sense related. So the objects are called vertices or nodes and each of the related pairs of vertices is called an edge or a link. So as you can see, uh, graph is a very common uh, type of structure for real world data at all scales. So for example, in atom level, a molecule can be seen as a graph where nodes are atoms and edges are covalent bonds. And a protein can also be seen as a, as a 3D graph where nodes are uh, amino acids and edges are uh, peptide bonds and hydrogen bonds. And in a molecule level, this protein-protein uh, interaction is a graph where nodes are proteins and edges are interactions between uh, proteins. And the synthetic rods can, uh, are also graphs where nodes are intermediates and edges are chemical reactions. And in human level, we have uh, social networks such as Twitter and Facebook and knowledge graphs, 
which tell uh, which tell us the uh, factor relationship among entities, and in in the uh, world level, we have this this navigation map and this five routes, and they can they can all be seen as uh, graphs. So typically, a graph is represented as a pair of uh, a pair of V and E, where uh, where V is this set of vertices and E is the set of edges. So given a graph G, we usually uh, use the adjacency matrix to represent this graph, in which uh, the entry i j equals one means that the node i and node j are connected by an edge. Otherwise, the entry i j is zero. However, what if the uh, what if we have a very large graph? So, for example, in Facebook, the social network may have billions of nodes and trillions of edges. So, to to uh, represent such a graph, we will need a very large adjacency matrix. But it brings us two problems. So, the first is uh, storage. The adjacency matrix will require O n square storage space, where n is the number of nodes. Uh, but actually, storage issue is not that essential because we can store this graph as a sparse matrix, which will save a lot of space. So the most severe issue is that it's hard to compute node similarity based on this adjacency matrix because the adjacency vectors are too sparse. So in other words, adjacency vectors do not reflect this semantic and structural information of nodes in a, in a graph. So is there a way to represent nodes which can preserve the graph structure and node semantics in such representation? And this is why we need graph representation learning. So graph representation learning is to learn a mapping that embeds nodes or edges or subgraphs or the entire graphs to points in a low dimensional vector space Rd so that the geometric relationship in this learned space can reflect the structure of the original graph. So here D is normally far smaller than number of nodes. So we can see this figure as an example. So given the graph in the left, where different colors denote different clusters, we can use graph representation learning to learn an embedding vector for each node, which is shown in the uh, right figure. So we can see that nodes with the same color tend to be close in this embedding space, which Shows uh, which shows that the, these node embeddings indeed characterize this node similarity. But uh, one thing to note is that the uh, position of node here are the embedding of nodes, so they do have a uh, physical meaning. But the position of these uh, nodes they do not have any meaning because this is just a visualization of a graph. Next, uh, we will, I will introduce some downstream tasks of graph representation learning. So first is link prediction, in which our goal is to predict whether there is an edge between two given nodes. Formally speaking, we aim to learn a mapping F, which takes the embedding of two nodes as input and output a binary label uh, indicating the, the edge existence. So the uh, link prediction task in the real world can be like, are there two user, uh, are the two users friends in a social network or is there a flight between the two uh, airports? The second task is a uh, node classification where we are going to predict the label of a given node. So uh, formally speaking, our goal is to learn a mapping from node embeddings to the set of node labels. And we uh, list some of uh, the real world node classification tasks here such as uh, is a user male or female in a social network, or what research field does a paper belong to in a citation network. And the last task is graph classification, in which our goal is to predict the, the label of a graph. And this can be formulated as learning a mapping from graph embeddings to a set of graph labels. For example, we are given a set of molecule graphs, which are toxic, and another set of uh, molecule graphs which are non-toxic and our goal is to predict whether a new molecule graph is toxic or not. Okay, so now let's see uh, what are graph neural networks. So uh, I assume that uh, you, you have already known this uh, graph neural networks, so I'll just uh, briefly 
I just uh, go through this quickly. So uh, actually GNN is a special type of graph representation learning methods. So this means that the, the input of a GNN is a graph and the output of a GNN is the embeddings of nodes in, in this graph. And typical GNNs follow a neighborhood aggregation uh, strategy. So here we use uh, HIK to denote the, uh, the hidden state of node i in, in iteration k. And this, uh, this hidden state is initialized as uh, xi, which is the initial feature of node vi. And, uh, and then we repeat this uh, iteration for uh, big k times. And in each iteration, for each node uh, vi, we use an aggregate function to aggregate the information of its neighbors and itself. So here you can see that we we aggregate this set H J K minus one, where J goes over the set the set of uh, I's neighbors and I itself, and this aggregated result is set as the hidden state of node I for the next iteration, and after a big K uh, iterations, we obtain this uh, H I K for each node I, which is returned as the final node embeddings. And uh, okay, so, so the only uh, remaining question is that how this aggregate function is implemented. And actually we do have a lot of uh, implementation for aggregate function, which will lead to different GN models. So here we just uh, take the graph convolutional network as example, which I believe is the uh, most well-known GN. So in GCN, uh, the aggregate is implemented as a weighted average. So here this, hj k minus one is the hidden state of node j in the previous layer and alpha ij is is a normalization uh, factor which is set as the uh, the inverse of the square root of the degree of node i times the degree of node uh, sorry it is node j so so the purpose of this normalization factor is to ensure that the scale of this aggregated result is uh, stable which means that the hidden state will not increase or decrease exponentially with the number of this uh, layer of K. And uh, after aggregation, we use a uh, nonlinear transformation, which means that we multiply this result by, by a trainable matrix WK followed by a nonlinear uh, activation function sigma, such as uh, ReLU here. And it's easy to see that this GCN can be written in a more uh, compact matrix form. So we use A to uh, denote the adjacency matrix and, and D is the uh, diagonal degree matrix of A, which means that the, uh, the i's element in the diagonal DII equals to the uh, degree of node i and elements of the diagonal are zero. And we use HK to denote the hidden state matrix of nodes in layer K. And, uh, Using these notations, we can rewrite the GCN formula in, in this way. So here, this D to the uh, negative one half is to normalize the adjacency matrix A, and which uh, it, which exactly corresponds to here, to, to this alpha IG. Okay, so uh, now I'll talk about the uh, first task, which is the, uh, the graph, uh, knowledge graph, completion. So this is based on uh, our uh, paper, Relational Message Parsing for Knowledge Graph Completion, which is published in KDD uh, this year. So first, uh, let's see what knowledge graphs are. So knowledge graphs uh, store structured information of entities and facts. So a knowledge graph uh, usually consists of a set of triples HRT. So each triple HRT means that the head H is related to tail T through this relation R. So here we give an example of a movie knowledge graph where you can see that the nodes are entities and edges uh, like, like movies and actors and uh, edges represent their relationship. Um, however, knowledge graphs are often incomplete and noisy. For example, given the, this uh, movie knowledge graph, a natural question is, is there any relation between the movie cast away and the person Tom Hanks, and what is the type of that relation? So to address this problem, uh, researchers propose to solve the knowledge graph completion problem 
in which a pair of uh, entities H and T is given, and the goal is to predict the relation R. So specifically, uh, this can be modeled as predicting distributions over relation types given H and T. In general, uh, relations are not uniformly distributed over a knowledge graph, but they are correlated with each other. So for example, given a relation graduated from, we know that the head may be a person and the tail may be a school. So the neighbor relations of, of the head are likely to be like a person dot birthplace or person dot gender. And the neighbor relation for the, uh, of the tail are likely to be the, like the institution dot location or the university dot founder or university dot president. And the relation uh, movie dot language is not likely to be uh, to be the neighbor, right? So these neighboring relations are called the relational context. And uh, in addition to relational context, we also observe that the relation are also correlated in terms of relational paths. So for example, given a relation called graduated from, we may find a reverse relation connecting this, uh, this, uh, this pair called called uh, has an army. And we may also find, uh, and, and there may also be a, a sequence of relations uh, like the school made of and graduated from, which connects this entity pair. So based on these motivations, we propose a new method, PASCON for knowledge graph completion, which is short for uh, PASS plus context. So the goal of PASCON is to predict the relation type R given head H and tail T. And here is the overview of PASCON. So PASCON consists of two modules. The first is the uh, relational context module in which we identify the multi-hope neighbor edges for the entity pair of H and T. And then we do message parsing on these edges. And the, the uh, second module is relational path module in which we, we identify all the relation, uh, all the relational paths connecting H and T. And then we calculate the, the representation of this path for predicting this relation R. So before introducing how relational message parsing works, let's first see a traditional node-based message parsing, which is exactly the, the, the uh, GNS I uh, introduced before, so assumes that uh, that this uh, assume that this SUI is the hidden state of node U in iteration I, and this big N uh, denotes the neighbor set. So in node based message processing, a node V first aggregate the information from its neighbors using this aggregation function A, and gets the uh, message M V I, and then the node V update updates its uh, state using an update function u. So this figure gives an example of node-based message parsing. So first we identify all the uh, neighbor nodes for this blue node, and then we aggregate message uh, from, from its neighbors and then update uh, the, the hidden state of itself. So node-based message parsing is uh, popular for general graphs but it faces the following challenges when applied to knowledge graphs. So first, unlike uh, general graphs, in most knowledge graphs, edges have features, but nodes don't have features, which makes node-based message processing less natural for knowledge graphs. And of course you can use node, node identities as their features, but this will lead to uh, another two uh, issues. So modeling the node identities cannot manage uh, the previously unseen nodes during inference. So uh, it fails in an in inductive setting. And moreover, in, in, in real world uh, knowledge graphs, the number of entities are much larger than the number of relation types, which requires a large memory for storing these uh, entity embeddings. So to address uh, the above problems, a natural result is to perform this message parsing over edges instead of nodes. So in edge-based, message parsing, we aggregate the information of neighbor edges for, for a given edge. 
So here you can see that uh, we, for this edge E, we first identify all the, all the neighbor edges for this edge E, which is E prime here. And then we aggregate all the uh, hidden states from this edge E. And then we do the uh, update using this update function U. And then uh, here we say that two edges are neighbors if they share at least one common node. And this figure uh, gives an example of relational message parsing. So, uh, so for this blue edge, e, uh, so for this blue edge, uh, we first identify all the neighbor edges for this blue edge, which is the red edges. And then we, we do the aggregation on this uh, red edges. So relational message parsing uh, avoids the drawbacks of uh, node-based message parsing, but it brings a new issue of, uh, of computational efficiency. So to, uh, to see this, we analyze the computational complexity of these two message parsing. So consider a graph with n nodes and m edges. The, and then the complexity of node-based message parsing in each iteration is 2n plus 2m. And the uh, complexity of relational message parsing is n times the variance of d plus uh, four times m squared divided by n. So here this uh, variance of d is the variance of node degrees in this knowledge graph. So you can see that the complexity of, of this uh, relational message parsing is, is much larger than this node-based message parsing. So to reduce the uh, complexity, we propose alternate relational message parsing for knowledge graphs. And this, uh, so here the, the aggregation step is decomposed into two steps. So first, for each node V, we aggregate the information of all, it, of all its neighbor edges, which is denoted as this MVI. And then for each edge E, we aggregate the information of its two endpoints U and V, which is denoted as this MEI. And the final uh, step is update, which remains the same. So here, in, in this example, you can see that, that so here, uh, so, so for, this, uh, for this blue edge, we first identify all the neighbor edges for this blue edge, which are the uh, red edges here. So first, uh, we aggregate the information from this red edges to, to these two uh, blue, uh, uh, to these two yellow nodes. And then we aggregate the information from these two nodes to this blue edge. And, uh, and finally, we, we, do this, uh, we do this update function here. So, so, uh, so here you can see that the information here flows between edges and nodes alternately, right? So we call this, so we call this alternate uh, relational message parsing. Uh, we can prove that the, the complexity of this alternate uh, message parsing is 6M, which greatly reduces the time overhead and, and it achieves the same order of complexity as this node-based message parsing. Okay, so uh, now let's see how to use uh, alternate relational message parsing to uh, process context. So we use uh, SEI to denote the hidden state of edge E in iteration I, and we use MVI to denote the message stored at node V in iteration I. So in each iteration, we, uh, for, node v, uh, for node V, we first uh, sum up the information of all its neighboring edges. And then for edge E, we concatenate the message of its two uh, endpoints, as well as the state uh, in, of the edge E in the previous iteration, and followed by a long linear layer. So uh, suppose that the number of iteration is K, and then the final message of H and T is MH K minus one and MT K minus one here. And next, we, we uh, discuss relational paths. So a row path from H to T uh, in a knowledge graph is a sequence of uh, relational types 
of all edges in, in a given, uh, sorry, a row pass uh, from H to T in a knowledge graph is a sequence of entities and, and edges in which two entities, uh, VI and VI plus one are connected by, by the edge EI. And the corresponding uh, relational pass P is the sequence of, of all the relational types of all edges in, in this given row pass, where this REI is the is the relation type of edge EI. So you can see that in, in, in this P, we only consider the relation type of all edges and we uh, and we omit all the uh, nodes. And uh, to make sure, uh, uh, to make use of relational paths, we go over every HT pair in this uh, knowledge graph and we enumerate all the relational paths with length, uh, with length uh, no more than air. And then we assign an independent embedding vector SP for each relation pass P. So uh, for relational, uh, so here uh, now we uh, introduce how to combine this relational context and relational pass. So uh, for relational context, we use message parsing scheme to calculate the final message MHK minus one and MTK minus one here, which summarizes the uh, their context information. And these two final messages are further combined, uh, combined together here and uh, followed by a nonlinear layer to calculate this uh, context of HT pair. And for relational paths, uh, note that there may be a number of paths for a given HT pair, but not all these paths are logically meaningful. And the importance of each path are also different. So we, uh, so we use an attention uh, mechanism to, to differentiate the importance of uh, pass. So here we first calculate the attention weight alpha P for pass P, and then we use the attention weights to average uh, all the pass embeddings SP. So given, uh, given the relational context representation and relational pass representation, we can predict relations by first adding these two Representations together, and then taking a soft max function, and our, and our model can be uh, trained by minimizing the loss between the predictions and the ground truths, and over all the training triples. Okay, so now uh, I'll introduce the experiments. So we conduct. Uh, so we 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 did uh, experiments on six data sets. Well, the first five are standard uh, knowledge graph benchmarks, and the last one, DDB14, is uh, proposed by us. So, so DDB14 is collected from this uh, disease database, which is a medical database containing ter uh, terminologies uh, and concepts such as uh, diseases, symptoms, and drugs, as well as their uh, relationships. So here, uh, so this table shows the uh, statistics of these four uh, of these six. Data sets. And for base science, we compare a model with uh, several state of the art embedding based methods, including this trans E, complex dismount, rotate E, simple E, and quad E. And, and uh, as well as one uh, pass based method, which is uh, drum. And we also do uh, ablation studies and propose to uh, reduce the version of our model, pass and con, which only uh, consider paths and context. And the number of uh, parameters uh, for, 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 uh, for each model is shown here. So we can see that pass count uh, is much more uh, storage efficient than this embedding based methods because it does not need to calculate and store entity embeddings. And the result of uh, relation prediction on all the uh, six data sets are present here, uh, here. So we use MRR and HIT at one as the uh, evaluation metrics. So here you can see that the uh, absolute uh, HIT at one gain of PASCON against the best baseline is shown here, which uh, shows that our, ma our method is uh, significantly better than its baselines. And we also observed that the most uh, standard deviation are quite small, which shows that, which shows the uh, stability of our model. 
So we have a question from one of our um, participants, uh, Jin Cheng Liu. Do you want to unmute and ask your question? Or uh, uh, Hong if you can see the chat, maybe you can also respond. Oh, uh, okay. Uh, let me take a look at the okay. question. I'll read it for you. How can relational message passing be conducted on the inductive setting? Um, like you mentioned before, where nodes are missing from the, the test. Yeah, uh, yeah, that is a good question. So uh, we, uh, so our model can be used in inductive setting. It's because like, we, we don't model the identity of nodes. This means that uh, our model can handle unseen nodes uh, during inference. So uh, yeah, I will, uh, I will introduce the, the uh, experiments on inductive settings uh, later, yeah. yeah. I think it's just uh, like in the next uh, slides. Okay, so, uh, so you can see that here, so, so here in, in this table, you can see that the result shows that the, in many cases, the pass or the this count on pass can already beat, beat most of the baselines and we uh, and combining this uh, relational context and relational paths together and can can uh, usually lead to even better performance. So uh, we also examine the performance of a method in inductive comp uh, knowledge graph completion. So in, in this uh, setting, we uh, remove some of the node, uh, we remove some of the nodes that appear in the test set from the training set. And then we use the remaining training set to train the model. And then we use the trend model to evaluate the test set. But uh, during evaluation, we, we need to add these nodes back into this graph because we, we, need, this, uh, we, need, we need these edges to calculate the context and pass. Yeah, so this is how we, we did, this, uh, did the experiments in, in inductive setting. So we uh, vary the ratio of remove the nodes in the test set from, from zero to one, which means that the setting changes from, from fully uh, transductive to fully inductive. And we notice that the performance of this uh, dismount and rotate E forced to a random, uh, for, uh, forced to a random guessing level here in, in the uh, inductive setting, but the performance of our method uh, only uh, decreases slightly. So does that uh, answer the question? Yeah, okay. I think it's, it's helpful. Yeah, I think we'll need a little bit of time to digest it, but yeah, please go ahead. Okay, okay. So, and uh, we also show the uh, expandability of a model on DDB14 that I said. So, uh, but I think uh, I, I need to skip this Part because we don't have enough time, I guess. So this is just show that our model can can explain like the important paths for for given relation. Yeah. Okay, so uh, now I'm going to uh, talk about the second topic: how graph how graph uh, how graph representation learning methods can be used in recommender systems. So let's first see uh, what um, are recommender systems. So uh, the explosive growth of online content and services has, uh, has provided so many choices for users. So uh, recommender systems intend to address the information explosion by finding a small set of items for users to meet their personalized interest. So here is a movie uh, uh, recommendation uh, on IMDb. So you can see that in the uh, web page of a movie, it, it uh, suggests that more people like these other movies, and this is uh, the uh, book recommendation on Amazon. And this is a point of interest recommendation on booking.com. And we can list more examples here. So this is Quora, where it, it recommends you the questions and answers you might be interested in. And this is TikTok, so you can see here, here is the tab uh, for you. And this is Spotify. So uh, I assume that uh, you, have uh, you all know this recommender systems where so I just uh, go through this quickly. So in recommender systems, we basically have two tasks, right? So the first is the rating prediction in which we are given a, a 
the ratings of users to items and, and, and the goal is to predict these missing ratings. And second is this uh, click-through rate prediction in which uh, we only know that whether a user clicked an item or not. So here these labels uh, are zero or one and our goal is to predict these missing uh, entries here. So, uh, so, so in general, collaborative, uh, collaborative filtering is a, is a popular uh, recommendation strategy. So CF assumes that similar users have similar preferences. So like in this example, to predict this missing rating, we can use CF to calculate this similarity between U4 and other users, right? Based on, uh, based on their historical uh, behavior. And then we can calculate this missing rating uh, uh, by by taking the uh, weighted average of 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 these ratings, right? So we can like we can use this similarity to average this rating, and then we can get the this uh, predicted score here. Uh, but the uh, one problem of the CF based methods is that it cannot handle the uh, this following two problems. So the first is that the so the first is the data sparsity. So the user item interactions are usually sparse in practice. So, so you know, if uh, uh, like using this limited data to predict a large amount of unknown information will increase the uh, risk of overfitting. And second is co-star problem because the CF based models cannot make uh, cannot make recommendation for new user or new item because there is no historical information for this newcomer. So to address this prob uh, problem, a common strategy is, is to incorporate additional information or the uh, side information, right? So uh, like typical uh, side information include social networks or user item attributes or this multimedia information or the uh, context information. So here we, we, we take knowledge graph as a side information for uh, recommended systems. So let's see how knowledge graph can help with recommended systems. So suppose we have a user who watched these uh, three films and these uh, three uh, and these uh, three movies are connected to these entities in a knowledge graph, and we and these entities are further connected to these three new movies. So we can see that these two sets of movies are highly connected to each other in terms of this knowledge graph. So so this example shows that the motivation of using knowledge graph in a current system is that knowledge graph can reasonably extend a user's uh, history, which help us to explore the user's potential interest. And uh, we, we also take a news recommendation as an, as an example. So suppose that a user uh, has read this news and we, we, can, uh, we can identify the uh, entities in, in this news title, and then we can like, we can extend this uh, this and it is in this knowledge graph, and finally we will reach another piece of news. So you can see that these two pieces of news are highly related in terms of this common sense reasoning, but actually they uh, they 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 do not have uh, any common words here, right? So 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 uh, this am this example shows that the knowledge graphs can help us to make a uh, reasonable inference on user interests. So here, uh, so now we 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 define the uh, our problem. So assume that we have a set of users and a set of items, and we define this uh, binary user engagement labels YUV, where YUV equals to one means that there is an implicit interaction between user U and and item V, or otherwise YUV is zero. And we also have a knowledge graph G available, which consists of uh, triples HRT. So we and we assume that each item correspond to an uh, correspond to an entity in this knowledge graph. So this so this uh, item set is a subset of the entity set. So given this uh, given this user engagement levels and this knowledge graph, we aim to predict whether user U has a potential interest in item V. So our goal is to predict. Uh, so our goal is to to predict this uh, YUV hat, uh, and and here the uh, hat means that this is a, a predicted value. 
Uh, okay, so uh, now uh, let's see. Uh, so so uh, in general, uh, knowledge graph enhanced uh, recommender systems can be classified into two categories. The first is is these embedding based methods. So typically, they for, uh, they first use knowledge graph embedding methods to process knowledge graphs and output this entity and relation uh, and relation embeddings. And then uh, they use recommender systems to process this uh, this user item uh, interaction and output these uh, embeddings for users and items. And finally, these two modules are combined together in in the embedding based methods. And and the uh, second type of knowledge graph uh, enhanced recommender system is the structure based methods, which focus more on the uh, graph structure information of this user item interaction and these knowledge graphs, and then use graph-based algorithm to solve this problem. So here, uh, so for the uh, first type, we uh, I will introduce this uh, work, the deep knowledge aware neural uh, network for news recommendation, which is based on our uh, W 2018 paper. So since we are doing a news recommendation, this, the first step is to uh, perform this knowledge distillation. So Given the corpus of all news titles in this uh, data set, we utilize the entity linking tools to, to associate them with the predefined entities in a knowledge graph. And next, we construct an, uh, a subgraph from the original knowledge graph. And then we can utilize the knowledge graph embedding method, which output the learning embeddings for, uh, for each entity. And in addition to, to entity embedding, we also extract the additional contextual information for each entity. So the context of an entity is defined as the set of its uh, first order neighbors in this knowledge graph. So this figure shows an example of context. So in addition to, uh, so we, we calculate the, the, uh, the context embedding of this five club using this, uh, using four, uh, using four neighbors and uh, so, given the uh, context of entity E, we uh, the context embedding is calculated as the average of its uh, context entities. So now uh, we have entity embeddings and context embeddings, and and we we'll, we can also use the uh, like word to vec to 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 learn the word embeddings of each word in news titles. So then, how can we process them them in a unified way? So before introducing our model, let's first see a classical uh, CN architecture for sentence feature learning, which is the Kim CNN. So given a sentence of length n, we have this uh, d times n word embedding matrix for this sentence, where d is the uh, dimension of word embedding, and n is the length of this uh, sentence. And then we, and uh, then we apply a convolutional uh, filter to this word embedding matrix. We move this filter across the whole sentence and get one feature map, which is a which is a row in in this feature map, and then uh, we can use uh, multiple uh, filters. So in this example, we we use uh, three filters of length two and four and four filters of length three. So for each feature map, we apply um max pooling operation and obtain the and obtain the one entry here so so here you can see that each row so uh, we apply this uh, max pooling for each row here and we get an entry here and then we contain it all the entry which uh, is the uh, final sentence embedding so the uh, kim CN only considers the word embedding so we propose a knowledge aware CN to come to combine this word embedding and, and entity embeddings together. So remember that uh, for a given sentence, we have this word embedding matrix in, in the bottom layer. And if a word is associated with an entity, we also have this uh, entity embeddings. Otherwise, the, the uh, correspond entries are padded as zero. So this gives us the entity embedding matrix in the middle layer. And similarly, we can also have this context embedding in the top layer. So these uh, three embeddings uh, have the same size and they can be viewed as the different uh, channels, right? 
So we, we, we align and stack these uh, three embedding matrix and apply the uh, convolution filters, just like Kim CNN. And we also use Max Pauline to, to get the final sentence embedding. Okay, so uh, now let's see how the recommendation module is designed. So given a user's uh, click history and a piece of uh, candidate news, we first obtain their embedding using this uh, case in introduced uh, before. So here, uh, so here, this is the uh, candidate uh, news embedding, and these are the embeddings of the news that this user has read before. And then we design an attention uh, network to extract the, the user's interest. So, so this, uh, so this attention network takes one of the users' click uh, news and the candidate news as input and output, and output a weight value here. So, given this weight value, we uh, we can we can sum up the user's history to get the user embedding. And finally, we can concatenate this uh, candidate candidate user embedding and this uh, user embedding together and and apply another. DN here to predict this uh, click through rate. Okay, so uh, here is the uh, data set we used. So this work is done while uh, I was an intern at Microsoft Research. So the data comes from the Bing News. So each piece of news, uh, uh, so each piece of our log mainly contains the timestamp, the user ID, the news URL, and news title, and a click label. So and uh, so uh, our knowledge graph comes from the uh, Microsoft Satori, which is the internal knowledge graph built by Microsoft. So, uh, so this table shows the uh, statistics of the uh, data set. So we have uh, about one million uh, logs of user item interaction and seven million of uh, triplets in in this knowledge graph. So here is the result of comparison uh, with baselines. So the uh, first column is the name of models and the, the this uh, minus sign means that the model is trained without any embedding. And second column is F1 score. The third column is AUC score. And the fourth column is the p-value. So you can see that DKM performs best among all methods and it, it uh, surpasses the best baseline by 1.7% uh, uh, on AUC. So uh, next, I will introduce uh, the uh, structure-based method, which based on our two papers uh, published in W and KDD. So uh, since the knowledge graph are a heterogeneous graph without explicit edges, so the first step for uh, of approach is to transform this knowledge graph into a weighted graph. So we introduced a user-specific um, Relation scoring function SUR, which takes the embedding of a user U and a relation R as input, and then output a score, indicating that the importance of this relation to this user. So, so uh, for example, in, in movie recommendation, one user may care more about the genre of movies, but but the other user may care more about the uh, actor of these movies, right? So this uh, relation scoring function identifies the important knowledge graph uh, relations for given user and transform this original knowledge graph into a user specific adjacent matrix AU. So here this width of these lines in this right figure shows the, the uh, edge weights. So note here that this AU has a, uh, has a subscript U here because this relation scoring function is user specific which means that for different users, the, the adjacency matrix uh, will also be different. So in, in, in this uh, knowledge graph convolution networks, we use this uh, GCN to, to, process, uh, to, to process the uh, this, uh, entity embeddings. So here you can see that, uh, so, uh, so the, the layer-wise uh, formula can, uh, is shown here. So, here the AU is the adjacency 
matrix of this knowledge graph for a particular user u, and this du is the diagonal degree matrix, and this uh, wl is the uh, transformation matrix, and this hl and hl plus one is the is the uh, embed uh, is the entity embedding matrix in in layer l and layer l plus one, and sigma is a nonlinear function. So to uh, to intuitive uh, to intuitively understand this formula, we can see this as a feature propagation scheme in this knowledge graph where we aggregate the neighborhood information of node V to calculate the uh, to calculate its embedding. So uh, the, the predicted uh, probability of user U engaging with item V is uh, calculated by this FUV in which the U is the user embedding and it's VU is the entity embedding from the last KGCN layer. And this F is a prediction function can, uh, such as this inner product or MLP. Uh, the rest part is based on the uh, KD paper. So I think I can just skip this part. Okay, so, uh, so in the last, uh, I'd like to discuss the difference and comparison among these methods. So the first is performance. So in general, the order of these methods with respect to performance is uh, KGN, LS, and uh, KGCN, and DKN. So as you can see that this is in, accord, uh, this is in accordance with the, the, the timeline of the publication date. But this is only a general conclusion because the exact performance of each measure largely depends on the, the specific data, right? And the performance is not the only thing we care about. We, we also care about their, uh, their scalability. So in general, the scalability of embedding-based methods is higher than structure-based methods. And this is because user item interaction change with time. And we will observe more and more data as the time goes. But knowledge graphs do not change that often, right? Because they are they are they are basically a uh, factual knowledge. So in so in in the uh, so in embedding based methods, knowledge graph embeddings can be learned for one time and reused for many times. But structure based methods are end to end models, which means that we need to train the whole model as long as we get some new data. And last is the. Uh, Expandability. So, uh, structure based methods are more expandable than embedding based ones, right? Because graph structures are more intuitive than embeddings. You know, embeddings are just some digits and vectors. So, uh, here comes the conclusion. So, in, in, in this talk, uh, I first introduced the uh, graph representation learning, which is a fundamental step in graph related tasks. Then, uh, I introduced this uh, graph neural networks. Which is a special type of uh, GIR methods. And then I introduced this knowledge graph, which is a special type of graphs. And then uh, I introduced the uh, two graph related tasks, which are knowledge graph completion and knowledge graph aware recommendation. And uh, that is all for my presentation. So you can find more information uh, at my uh, personal website and all the source code are, are available uh, at my GitHub. Thank you. Uh, thank you for uh, Wang's talking. So if you have any question, you can ask me now. So actually I have uh, one like interesting point I find in your last two pages, how do you find the KGN's uh, label smoothness is best one. So does it, that means the, the knowledge graph is not that well trained before enter the recommender because if because it's fine that if it apply the label smoothness on the knowledge graph, it will be better. So which means that the uh, yeah, uh, I I do not have enough time to introduce this this method. Yeah, this is because like uh in 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 uh in this KGCN in this case so in in traditional uh GNs this consistency matrix is fixed. And we only need to learn this W, right? But in this KGCM, this uh, both the adjacency matrix and W uh, requires training. Yes, yeah, so this will increase the risk of overfitting. 
So in in this uh, paper, we introduce uh, we we introduce an additional term to uh, like to regularize the learning of this KGCN. Yeah. So we we use the this uh, label smoothness. So we use this label smoothness assumption to to like to add additional contracts uh, constraint for for this uh, for for this model. Yeah. Uh, what is the A means here, by the way? A is the adjacency matrix of the knowledge graph. Oh, in the knowledge graph. So it's like to you can you can see the A here. Yeah. So. So we need to like, because the knowledge graph uh, does not contain edge weights, right? So we need to first transform this knowledge graph into a weighted graph. Yeah, so yeah. here this A is the uh, adjacent matrix for this knowledge graph. Oh, okay, I see. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so can I have a question? Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, I wonder what's the difference between like news recommendation and other data sets you use in like the previous two paper? Because previous two paper majorly use like a movie recommendation, right? So what kind of difference between like movie recommendation and news recommendation? Uh, actually, there's uh, no is no essential difference between movie and news. Uh, so in terms of knowledge graphs, so the difference is that uh, each movie corresponds to exactly one entity in a knowledge graph, right? But each piece of news may correspond uh, multiple entities. So each piece of news can correspond to many, to uh, multiple entities in a knowledge graph. Yeah, I think that's the difference. Yeah, but but actually this difference is not that essential because you can average you can average all the uh, entity embeddings in your news. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Nilam, do you want to ask your question? Yes, can you hear? Yes, yeah. you're very faint, yeah. So, so I'm new to recommender systems. So could you maybe clarify how to evaluate recommendation systems uh, given that the user does not interact with all available options all the time? I'm um, sorry, uh, uh, your voice is not- question like question is also on the chat, but I'll read it out if you can hear my voice okay. Oh, okay, uh, okay. Yeah. So uh, Guilherme asks, uh, I'm new to recommendation systems. Could you clarify how you evaluate recommendation system given that a user does not interact with all available options? Uh, uh, basically, we, we, we can evaluate a recommender system in two ways. So the first is, uh, let me see if I have this result. So the first is like we can uh, I'll use the, Result. The second part. Yeah. So the first is like we can we can calculate this AUC, right? So this is uh, done by like you can you can sum uh, like you can use uh, you can use the training data as the as positive uh, samples, and then you can sample you can sample some uh, user item pair that does not appear in both training and test data as negative samples. And then you can use this uh, positive and negative samples to like, you can, you can construct this new uh, test data and then you can, and then you can use your model to predict that like, uh, like so, so now your model is like, it's a binary classification model, right? So it needs to predict whether this use item interaction is true or false, right? So, so now you can use like the AUC or accuracy or, or F1 score to evaluate your model. And the second uh, scenario is, is like you can, you can calculate, like you can use, uh, 
you can you can uh, calculate the, the, the top click recommendation, right? This means that uh, for uh, for a given user, uh, you can calculate the score of this user between all the items, and then you can rank all the items based on the scores, and then you can calculate. So so now this problem is formulated as a, a ranking problem, right? So now you can use like the recall and k or precision and k as the matrix. Yeah. So these are basically the two uh, evaluation scenario you can use. Uh, is that clear? Yeah, I think it was clear. Uh, Guillaume uh, wrote yes and thanks on, on the chat. Okay, uh, so, okay. I see some questions in the, in the chat box. Uh, Hi Hong, we can I ask a question? Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, thanks for the talk. Um, I'm not from NUS, I'm from ASTAR, so hello to people from NUS as well. Uh, I'm, I'm coming from a graph neural networks background, and I think one big takeaway from your talk was that uh, by moving away from, let's say, trans-E and complex type uh, knowledge graph embedding methods, um, we can really reduce the parameter count especially, right? We're not storing embedding matrices anymore. Um, does, does that make message passing approaches like PathCon more efficient or more scalable to huge knowledge graphs, you know? Because uh, in graph neural networks, as you might know, like open graph benchmark is really trying to, uh, let's say, tackle really large scale graphs and even really large scale knowledge graphs, right? So do you think there's an advantage there? Yeah, uh, I sh showed the result of the number of parameters here. Right. Yeah, so uh, wait a sec, I'll jump to the slides. Yeah, so, so this table shows the number of parameters or for all the models on, on this DDB14 data set. Yes, so you can see that, yes, you can see that basically this, yes, you can see that, that the, the number of parameters in our model is much less than these models. This is because these are all embedding based methods. So they need to, they need to assign an embedding for each node and so uh, for each node and each relation type. Yeah, right. but our model, we do not uh, model this uh, node identities. Yeah, we, we only model these uh, relation types. Yeah, so this makes our model more uh, storage efficient. Yeah, so so for this OGB data set, uh, I think this model can, for now it can only be used to knowledge graphs. Yes, yeah, so if you have a large knowledge graph, uh, right. yeah, so you can use this model to like, you can only, so you need, you only need to model the, the relation type, yeah. Right, um, but do you think that makes it more efficient than transi? You know, that, does that improve the scalability of uh, knowledge graph embedding? Uh, what do you mean by scalability of knowledge graph embedding? I mean, uh, in terms of, let's say, GPU memory usage or uh, just, the, the largest size of knowledge graph that you could maybe train on? Uh, uh, I think the, um, I think for the GPU memory usage, the bottom neck is the batch size, right? Yeah, so, okay. so like, yeah, so even if your model is very large, but like you can control the batch size neck to, to make your GPU to make your model works on GPU, yeah. So, I think the uh, I think the scalability is more like like the training time, right? So, for for our model, like you may need um, much you know shorter time to train a model, but you may need more time to train uh, this train C. Yeah. I see. I see. Um, okay. Um, and. Then I, I guess finally, right? Do you think um, 
it's simple to kind of extend to also knowledge graphs that are containing attributes like rich node features. Uh, so, so you mean your, your knowledge graph contain, uh, contains rich node features? Right. Oh, okay, so it, yeah, in this case, like you can, so, uh, so uh, in, in our model, we do not consider node features, but actually you can use, uh, you can make use of node features using our model. Like you can, for example, you can uh, here, yeah, here. So right. if you have node features, you can uh, add your node features to here, right? So you can see that this MVI is the message stored at node V. Yeah, so if you have node features, you can like, you can encode your node features into, into, uh, into uh, embedding, which has the same length as this one. And then you can add your node features into this one. Yeah, so in this way, you can, you can model your node features, yeah. But, uh, so as long as your node feature does not contain node, node identity, this, right. this model is still like inductive. Yeah. I see. So then when you get a new node, then you can just simply uh, right, apply yeah. this model. If you get a, yeah, if you get a new, new node, yeah, uh, you can like you can encode the feature of that node and then you can add the node feature into here. Yeah. So everything the same. I see. Great. Uh, that helps a lot to understand. Uh, thank you, Prof. Wang, and thank you for the questioner. And I think time is up. Uh, if you have more questions, you can maybe reach our website and or contact us or contact Prof. Wang. So thanks for Wang's talk today. And thank you all for joining this seminar. OK, thank you. Thank you all. So uh, Prof Wang, uh, can you hold on for a while while we have our closed uh, Q&A session uh, with our group? Yeah, or yeah. Thank sure. you all 